I'm Margo Matwichuk. I'm director of the Social Justice Studies program. Welcome to the Social Justice Studies annual lecture. I'd like to begin by calling on David Parent uh, to welcome you here this evening. Uh, David is an undergraduate student in Indigenous Studies and Anthropology and a firekeeper for the Native Student Union. I just actually, I'm sorry, Margo, but I want to make a correction. I can't do a welcome. Uh, I can acknowledge the territory, but first I want to uh, just open this up and sit and ask if there are any. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so one of those already introduced me. My name is David. Uh, I'm Metis, my family is. So, I say that to bring my relation. So, I... Uh, that mine. Help as a trespasser here, even if uh, the people. I'll also acknowledge that I'm a, a visitor on these territories, having previously been a visitor on the territories of Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 First Nations in Manitoba. Uh, before I introduce Harsha, I would like to make a few notice, uh, make a few uh, announcements. Uh, just to acknowledge as well that this event this evening is co-sponsored by the Department of History and CAPI, and I especially thank John Price for his assistance in uh, arranging this talk. Uh, we have some copies of uh, Harsha's book for sale at the back. They're, they're $20, uh, so you can uh, go and pick one up at, at the end of the, the, the evening. Uh, just to also acknowledge, there is a talk coming up on Monday, or on, on sorry, I, I forgot the paper in front of me here, uh, on Saturday, November 1st from 3 to 5 p.m. that some of you may be interested in, called Migrations and Misconceptions. Misconceptions, Understanding Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program, and it's put on by the Victoria Coalition in support of temporary workers. I've also left some cards laying around, uh, which is a chew on this. Uh, it's a call for, for the federal government to come up with an anti-poverty strategy. Uh, if you're interested in signing these cards, uh, you can take it and mail it yourself, or if you want, you can just sign them and leave them on the table at the end of the evening, and I'll put them all in an envelope uh, and send them directly to save uh, the uh, dignity for all group uh, some postage money. Uh, so you're welcome to, to just leave those behind. Uh, just to also note, the next Social Justice Studies talk will take place on November 7th at 3 p.m. and Kathy Ferguson will be talking about anarchism, women, and public space. So look for our announcement of that talk. Uh, it gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome Harsha Walia. Harsha is a social justice activist, writer, and popular educator based in Vancouver on ceded Coast Salish territories. Born in Beiran, Walia grew up in Delhi and other points throughout the Middle East. She lived briefly in the eastern U.S. before moving to Canada. She has been involved in community-based grassroots migrant justice, feminist, anti-racist, indigenous solidarity, anti-capitalist, 
Palestinian liberation and anti-imperialist movements for over a decade. Her formal training was in law. She is co-founder of the Vancouver chapter of No One is Illegal and author of the book Undoing Border Imperialism. Her writings have appeared in over 50 journals, anthologies, and magazines. She has contributed essays to academic journals as well as chapters in the anthologies Power of Youth, Youth and Community-Led Activism in Canada, Beautiful Trouble, A Toolbox for Revolution, and Organize, Building for the Local from the local for global justice. She has made a number of presentations to the United Nations on social and economic justice issues. She has been named one of the most influential South Asians in British Columbia by the Vancouver Sun and one of the 10 most popular left-wing uh, journalists by the Georgia Strait in 2010. She is the winner of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives Power of Youth Award. Uh, Award-winning author Naomi Klein has called Walia one of Canada's most brilliant and effective political organizers. It is our great pleasure to have you with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you, folks. Thank you all for, for being here, and thank you to everyone who's involved in organizing um, and hosting me here. I also want to acknowledge and give thanks to the unseated uh, Coast Salish territories that I'm on here today, on uh, the Congwen and Wasanich um, nations on whose land I'm a visitor. I live in Vancouver, which is land of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Um, and for me, particularly because I'm going to be speaking about migrant justice, uh, it's really important for me, and I think all of us, to really foreground our struggles as migrant justice organizers and really as, as social justice activists and, and settlers, um, period, on these lands, um, as settlers, as people who are visitors on these territories, and specifically for those of us who identify as migrants, as people of color, to understand that although it is incredibly difficult to exist within this state, that we face you know, centuries and decades of impoverishment and racism within Canada, and for many of us, we come from a legacy of global empire and occupation and dispossession, um, and it is so hard to build home, it is so hard to find stability, it is so hard to find belonging, that while we are struggling um, to find home and to build community, to also recognize that we are building our homes on the ruins of others, that we're building our homes on an ongoing project of colonial genocide and dispossession of indigenous people, and to really center our struggles within a framework of respecting and honoring indigenous sovereignty. And so for me, particularly as a migrant justice organizer, um, when I organize to reject uh, the white supremacist Canadian nation state and the way in which its borders control who has access to these lands or not. I also want to say that for me it means respecting and honoring indigenous nationhood and respecting and honoring indigenous laws that are inherent and natural to these lands. Um, and to learn, as I think all of us need, to learn what indigenous host laws are wherever we reside. Um, and so No One Is Legal, which is a movement that I am part of, one of the things that we say is no one is illegal, Canada is illegal. And I think that, you know, for me, when I foreground this, this talk, I want to assert that, the idea that nobody is illegal, human beings are not fundamentally illegal, but nation states like Canada are fundamentally illegal since their very founding is, of course, in, in settler colonial violence. Um, so I'm here to speak about movements undoing border imperialism. Um, for me, the, the connection to talking about borders is, is deeply personal. Um, and I also want to say that because I've written a book, but I'm not really an author for folks who know me that's not the history that I come from. Um, and it's particularly in the university context, so it's, it's not going to be a really necessarily intellectually rigorous <laughs> scholarly body of work. Um, but for me, this is a deeply personal um, a deeply personal issue. So I come from a family that's been affected personally by borders. My mother's side of my family comes from the Punjab, which for people who are familiar with, Punjab was partitioned uh, into India and Pakistan after formal independence in 1947. And so my mother's family was one of two million other families who were forcibly displaced and whose families were separated as a result of this completely colonially imposed border, uh, as a result of the British Raj, as a result of 
the colonization of South Asia by British Empire. Um, subsequently, my mother's side of the family was dispossessed and lost land in India, in Punjab, as a result of the Green Revolution, which for people who, um, how many folks know about the Green Revolution? I guess in, for those who don't, in short, there's nothing green about the Green Revolution. It was an industrial revolution that completely decimated the Punjab, which has historically been the agricultural um, basket and the, and the agricultural heartland of South Asia. And so as a result of massive industrial scale farming, as a result of monocropping, as a result of mega corporations like Monsanto coming in and forcing privatization um, onto lands, uh, thousands and thousands of farmers lost their land. And that's, you know, has now played out into the crisis of farmer suicides in Punjab, right, which people hear about in the news a lot. So my mother's side of the family uh, was impacted by that. Um, my father spent his entire adult life as a migrant worker in the Middle East. Um, and like many other migrant workers in the Middle East, was constantly deported. My dad was deported at least two times. Um, and one, one of those times I was with him. So for us, this, this experience as a family has been so directly and clearly implicated as a result of, of border violences. Um, I myself, most people don't think that I'm from somewhere else. People think that I was born in Canada. I wasn't. Um, I came here to Turtle Island approximately 14 years ago and lived uh, with precarious legal status for about nine of those years, 10 of those years, and lived under a deportation order for most of that time. Um, I was detained in detention centers in Canada. Uh, in subsequent immigration ministers like to call detention center hotels. As someone who was incarcerated in one of them, I can tell you detention is not a hotel. Um, detention is a prison. Uh, you know. And Jason Kenney, the former immigration minister, likes to say that uh, one of the ways in which refugees and detainees can get out of um, immigration detention is simply to leave Canada. And so, you know, that's, that's the loss of freedom that detainees experience, which is uh, the fact that if, you're, if you willingly concede to your deportation, then you can become free of incarceration, right? So it's a condition of incarceration. Um, so that just by way of introduction is my um, commitment to undoing border imperialism. And also, in addition to my personal experience, I come to this work from a movement-based perspective as someone involved in migrant justice organizing through No One Is Legal and other movements. Um, and I also want to say that because I know when folks like me or others who write a book, there tends to be a tendency to create celebrities, right? The idea that there's one person responsible for movements, one person responsible for ideas. Um, and that's not the case for me. Uh, the work that I write, the, the words that I speak to you of come from a grounded experience alongside many others who are in the struggle with me, and also many ancestors and many people who led the way for these movements to, to be what they are today. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. Um, so in terms of undoing border imperialism, uh, and, and why undoing border imperialism, so for me, I've, I've thought a lot about borders, experienced borders a lot. And one of the things that I um, was you know, frustrated with and felt really stifled by was the ways in which we talk about borders, right? So we talk about borders and we talk about immigration in really domesticated ways. We talk about immigration fundamentally, you know, the really kind of conservative narrative is like, we don't want immigrants, immigrants are stealing jobs, white Canada forever, la la la, right? That's the really conservative rhetoric around immigration and borders. But even the more liberal, seemingly humane conversation around borders is still framed around how the state will manage immigration. So the kind of liberal response to immigration is like, well, we need immigrants because they're you know, filling up the jobs that no one else will do. We need immigrants for their labor. Uh, we need immigrants because immigrants are good for the economy. Um, we need refugees. We need to accept more refugees because Canada has a very liberal, proud tradition of accepting refugees, right? So um, essentially a multicultural liberal notion is the counter to the really racist narrative on immigration. And to me, both of these are obviously the racist one is racist, um, but even though the liberal liberal framings around immigration are really limiting. And fundamentally, they're limiting uh, because they, I would argue, domesticate the issue of immigration, first and foremost. Um, and by that, I mean we start to talk about immigration as something that just the Canadian state has to respond to. So the Canadian state can determine how many immigrants to accept, how many to refuse, how many refugees to accept, whether refugees or immigrants are integrating, quote unquote, properly, right? So it's still essentially a question of the state managing as the benevolent actor 
how to manage migration. And for me, in contrast to that kind of discussion about immigration, border imperialism, which I suggest is a more useful um, framework to talk about borders and immigration, is because it really talks about systemic issues, right? The first and foremost of which is, how is migration even a phenomenon? How is it that there is one billion people who are migrants on this planet? How did we get to that place? Um, and you know, one billion is arguably conservative estimates by the United Nations, which is you know, by no means a radical organization. Um, and so for me, you know, at the core of this question of border imperialism is the, is the question of how are people being displaced in the first place? How are people becoming migrants? And it is no coincidence that the majority of the people on this planet who are displaced people who are migrants are people who are coming from the so-called global south to the so-called global north. It's people who are coming from indigenous communities, from remote communities, from rural communities into urban centers that represent capital. It's no coincidence that the majority of people who are migrating, who are displaced across the board, across this planet, within borders, across borders, are people who are brown and black, right? This is not a coincidence that the people who are most likely to be displaced and dispossessed are people who are rich, not people who are, are people who are not rich, are people who are poor, right? And so these asymmetries reveal relationships of power. They reveal relationships of empire. They reveal relationships of heteropatriarchy. They reveal relationships of race, right? Um, and again, this is, this is not a coincidence because we live in a global system of empire and capitalism and racism and oppression. And so at the core of, of this issue of, border, of imperialism and border imperialism, the first thing that I want to talk about is the role of empire, right? Which is what are the ways and how are the ways in which Canadian empire is creating and causing immigration? Um, so, you know, there's, there's so many examples that we can give. I want to just give a few. The first is the ongoing role of Canada in empire building globally. So right now, Canada has just re-entered into a war in Iraq, right? Canada is just sending troops into northern Iraq under the guise of fighting the Islamic State, this never-ending war on terror that's been going on for 13 years. Um, and as a result of this war on terror, which has been going on for 13 years, there's been approximately 4.7 million displaced people in Iraq and Afghanistan. 4.7 million displaced people. The majority of displaced people actually are displaced internally within borders or are you know, seeking refuge in neighboring countries like Pakistan and Iran. And I say that because one of the greatest myths of the West is the idea that the West accepts a disproportionate number of refugees and displaced people, right? So over two million of displaced people from Iraq and Afghanistan are actually internally displaced or going to neighboring countries. Um, anyone want to venture a guess approximately how many refugees from Afghanistan Canada accepted within the span of 10 years? Lower. Bit higher. <laughs> so we're around 2,500. 2,500 in approximately nine years, right? So here we see the, the very clear contradiction as well as complicity. So on the one hand, Canada imagines itself as so welcoming and the numbers of people are so low. And second of all, of course, we have the direct complicity of countries like Canada in actually displacing people in the first place, right? By sending um, forces and creating a situation of perpetual war and occupation. Um, the other thing that that reveals, of course, is that in the, the kind of the rhetoric that we were given for the occupation of Afghanistan in the first place, we had the really, again, the really racist, overt, civilizing, crusading, we have to go in and get the terrorist discourse. We also had the kind of putatively feminist humanitarian discourse, right, which is that we're building schools, we're liberating women, and of course the ideology of liberating women is, has been a constant within civilizing missions. The idea that, you know, brown women need to be saved from brown men by white civilization, what, you know, Guy Three Spivak um, names it as that, is something that is so old, right? The civilizing mission to save brown women from brown men was one of the other justifications that was given for the occupation of Afghanistan, which is that we're actually doing it for the benefit of, of Afghan people. So again, this is you know the ways in which Canada refuses to actually accept 
um, refugees from Afghanistan is a really clear example of the lack of humanitarian intervention in Afghanistan, right? Because if Canada was actually interested in being humanitarian, then the very clear victims of displacement would be the very first on their list, if you will, right? That would be the very obvious choice. Um, and even of those very few, you know, the couple of thousand people who were accepted, again, you know, goes in direct counter to this kind of feminist rhetoric, disproportionately 80% of them were men um, or are men. And within that, the ones who were accepted were those who were willing to basically serve Canadian interests. And this was true in the United States as well. So you're more likely to be accepted as a refugee from Afghanistan in Canada if, for example, you served um, or helped the Canadian Armed Forces or the US Armed Forces by being interpreters, by being drivers, et cetera. So basically, if you're willing to serve the interests of empire against your own people, which is one of the key ways in which empire works all the time, right, to be the so-called native informant, if you're willing to serve empire, if you're willing to inform on your people, then you have a pathway to citizenship in Canada, right? So essentially, this benevolence, as limited as it is, is tied to the interests of empire. Um, a second uh, example, or actually before I give you a, a second example, the, the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan um, and this kind of global, this global expansion of empire is of course so deeply connected to ongoing settler colonialism, right? They would not, they're both in conjunction with each other and through each other. And the, way, and the role that Canada plays in empire abroad is only because of its own legacy in settler colonialism, right? Because Canada has perfected how to dispossess people, how to divide indigenous communities, how to divide people from their lands, how to create create this, um, this, you know, the systems, the imposed systems, um, the non-indigenous settler systems of governance onto people, and of course, central to that is the question of colonial gendered violence. So in the same ways in which um, humanitarian intervention in places like Afghanistan is justified under the rubric of feminism, we also see colonial gendered violence as central to the project of settler colonialism, right, which is to dispossess indigenous women from the land and to affect, and you know, the understanding that the Canadian state has is that the rape on indigenous women's bodies is reflected on the rape on Mother Earth, right, and vice versa, and that's central to empire locally as well as globally. Um, and this, of course, plays out through economic imperialism as well. So free trade agreements like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, of which Canada is you know, a signatory. And NAFTA is just one symbol of a multitude of free trade agreements and economic trade agreements that Canada has signed. Um, I want to say you know, one of the trade agreements that's been making the news a lot recently is FIPA, right? the Canada-China FIPA. But the Canada-China FIPA is not the only free trade agreement that's out there. You know, I would argue that the only reason, or one of the main reasons that we see see the Canada-China FIPA in the news because it is one of those rare moments where Canada is a junior partner in a free trade agreement, right? So Canada is really worried about how China is going to take over Canada's resources, but most Canadians don't care when Canada is the aggressor, is the imperialist power, is the senior partner in free trade agreements. And that is actually a majority of free trade agreements that Canada is participating in. Um, and that's really important to name, right? Because every time we're going to talk about Canada and China um, entering into a FIPA and how dangerous FIPA is, I would encourage people to actually start talking about other free trade agreements as well. Um, because this idea of Canada, um, Canada's resources being lost to China is, um, you know, it's barely scratching the surface of the devastation in the global south that's been done as a result of free trade agreements. Um, and NAFTA being one example of that. So the North American Free Trade Agreement, for you know, folks who are unfamiliar really quickly, was implemented and passed in 1994. So we're looking into 20 years of, of NAFTA. And one of the key um, effects of NAFTA was that over 15 million, by really conservative estimates, 15 million farmers and peasants lost their lands in Mexico. And that was a result of two key provisions um, but you know many others, but two key provisions. One was as a result of NAFTA, or you know embedded in NAFTA, was the stipulation that the Mexican government had to privatize previously communally held land. So ejidos, which were communally held land, which is of course how a lot of peasant communities and indigenous communities tend to hold land, which is um, the antithesis of the, the private capitalist model, right? The antithesis of private property. Um, Peasants and, and landholding communities were forced to privatize their land. So people were forced to accept to um, take on this fee simple private property model, and people ended up with really small parcels of land which were not sustainable because people tended to share land, right, and grow across their kinship networks. The second thing that happened is Mexico was forced to remove state subsidies to grow corn. So corn, which is indigenous to many parts of Mexico, grows in the ecosystem as an indigenous um, food system. Subsidies were removed, but the United States continued to subsidize corn growers, including in areas of the United States where corn does not even grow, 
right? So massive state subsidies were put in to destroy the ecosystem to force monocropping on land that did not traditionally grow corn. Right? And that's how, obviously, agricultural industry and agricultural farming works. We force things to grow where they don't even grow. Um, and so as a result of this provision in NAFTA, the Mexican, um, or Mexico was flooded with American imports of corn. So even though corn was indigenous to communities in Mexico, it became cheaper to buy GMO, uh, monocropped, agriculturally farmed corn from the United States in Mexico than indigenous grown corn, right? Which is why now growing corn is such a form of resistance in indigenous communities in Mexico, right? In places like Chiapas, Guerrero, Oaxaca, et cetera, growing corn is a form of resistance. Um, so as a result of these provisions, essentially, you know, free trade agreements are corporate rights pacts where companies have the right to access land. And this is one of those contradictions of capitalism and borders, which is that board, capital can cross freely across borders. Free trade agreements, war, empire, military does not respect borders, right? Though the, the sovereignty of people, the sovereignty of indigenous communities, of tribal communities, of peasant communities is constantly violated by forces of economic and political imperialism, NAFTA being one of them. Um, but simultaneously, what we have is a militarization of borders of people. So the same year that NAFTA was implemented and the borders of Mexico was open to the U to US capital, Operation Gatekeeper was implemented, which meant the securitization, millions and millions of dollars started going into securing the US-Mexico border. And this was done by the Clinton administration, right, by the Democrats. This isn't a Bush thing. Border militarization didn't happen under George Bush. It started under Clinton administration. Um, and also important to note that it happened in the same year. So it's not as if the governments did not know that free trade agreements would cause massive displacement. They knew very well that the impacts of free trade agreements, of economic imperialism, would in fact be human displacement, right? And they started putting in millions and millions of dollars um, into border militarization. And as a result of Operation Gatekeeper and subsequent border militarization policies that we see continue today, it's estimated that anywhere up to 6,000 to 10,000 people have died at the border of the United States and Mexico. And this happens all across the world. Every single day, eight migrants die. Every single day, eight migrants die trying to cross borders on this planet, right? The majority, of course, not coincidentally, from places in the so-called global south to the so-called global north, right? And the one thing that I want to challenge, even as I say border deaths, right, is that border deaths is a really passive term. Border deaths suggest that somehow people just coincidentally die at the border, right? And we see that in the framings of border deaths in the United States, right? That bodies are found in the US-Mexico desert or in the desert on the border area, right? But these aren't border deaths. These are border killings. And I think it is so necessary to reframe border deaths as border killings, right? And the reason it is so important is that it squarely places responsibility on the state for creating policies of militarization that kill people. Right? And this is so important. I think it is so important because in the same way in which, you know, when we talk about rape culture, it is so important to not lay blame on victims, right? To not say that, you know, we know, we know this, the tropes of, of rape culture, which is, you know, why are women and genderqueer and trans folks dressing a certain way? Why are they out at night? Why aren't they looking after their own drinks? You know, why are they acting flirtatiously? All of the, the millions of victim blaming excuses that place the onus on folks who experience heteropatriarchy to justify rape rather than actually placing blame on patriarchy and misogyny, right? That's how rape culture works. I would argue that the same kind of logic operates when we talk about border deaths, right? Migrants are essentially victim blamed for their own death, right? It's, so with the narratives that play out in the media is like, well, they knew that it was gonna be blistering hot. Why did they cross the desert? Why did they you know, stow away in a shipping container knowing that they would probably die? Right? Those are the same victim blaming narratives at play when we talk about migrant deaths, which is why, again, it is so important to name them as, as migrant killings and as border killings, because people are being killed. They don't happen to drop dead at a border. Um, and you know, this becomes really important, again, going back to this idea of, of border imperialism, because when we're talking about border imperialism, for me, it is so important to, to place responsibility for migration and displacement squarely where it rests, which is in state policies, in empire building, and in capitalism, right? So by looking at the forces of, of displacement, both internally to borders and across borders that, that impact communities of color, indigenous communities, peasant communities, tribal communities, et cetera, we start to see that immigration is not a coincidence, 
Immigration is a direct result of forces of displacement that has created dispossession of millions and millions of people across this planet. Right? And that dispossession is intergenerational. Like for me, as I described at the beginning, right? You, we lose our language, we lose our land, we lose our connection to community, we lose our connection to family, we lose everything that we, that we come to represent as like the homeland, right? as the motherland. Um, and we're in this, this constant limbo of, of not really belonging. And so this is the second point that I wanted to talk about in terms of border imperialism, which is the way in which racism underpins this whole discussion and conversation. Um, and what I would argue is, is that immigration, although it's often framed as a legal debate, right, a policy debate about law and policy and what kind of policy is being passed or not being passed, et cetera, that fundamentally it's a conversation about race and racism. Right? And there's so many ways we can look at that and point that out, but I will, I'll do it in two s simple ways. How many folks here get asked, where are you from? Yeah, and then you're like, I live in Victoria on the Congo and Wasanich territories. People are like, no, where are you really from? Do you get that, like that follow-up question? Yeah, and then you're like, la, 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 same answer. No, no, where are you really from? Where are your parents, right? You know, you know where I'm going with this, right? This never-ending questioning of like, where are you really from, right? And that line of questioning does a series of things, right? So that line of questioning, I would argue is, even though it's innocuous, it's fundamentally rooted in race, right? Which is, first of all, the people who are asked that question, especially persistently, are folks of color, right? White folks, when, when white people answer, where are you from? And they say, you know, oh, I live in Victoria. And hopefully they say, you know, acknowledge the territories. But if not, no one says, well, oh, you're from Victoria? Like, which British colonizers or French colonizers were your people really from, right? Like, which, which, which ancestry, which colonial ancestry do you come from? Folks aren't asked that, right? The assumption is, is that white people are from here, right? And what that does, again, is it, it continuously situates people of color as from somewhere else, and it also simultaneously situates white people as indigenous to Turtle Island, which they're not, right? White people are not indigenous to Turtle Island. Indigenous people and indigenous nations are indigenous to Turtle Island. So this line of questioning centers white supremacy in two parallel kind of ways. One, by erasing settler colonialism, and two, by constantly situating people of color as eternal outsiders, as never actually belonging to the spaces and the lands that they might have inhabited and their communities have inhabited for centuries, right? So for example, in the, in the case of the Chinese Canadian community, itself a dualized right, Chinese Canadian community, have inhabited these lands for centuries, have existed on these lands for centuries, um, and have been in relationship in a lot of cases with indigenous communities on these lands for centuries. Um, they, they continue to be cast as, as constant outsiders, right? So that line of questioning, where are you from, has very little to do with one's immigration legal status. It has everything to do with race and belonging and racialization, and the idea of white supremacy is hegemonic to the nation state, right? Um, the other example um, that I can give, and this is particularly true for, for so-called British Columbia, is the statistics of people who are actually illegal. So of course there's this question of who's illegal, right? Which is that all of, all of us who are non-indigenous to these lands are illegal and are visitors and settlers on these lands. But even from a legal framework, a colonial legal framework of who is illegal, quote unquote, which is the idea of who is undocumented, right? Who is non-status, who has overstayed a legal visa. What's the stereotype that most people would, that comes to mind? You don't have to believe it. But if someone was to say, you know, who are illegals in British Columbia, who would you think of? I heard a whisper. Say it. What would you think? Brown folks, right? Like mostly people think of Latino people, right? Latinos and Latinas, similar to the United States, because we're also so, um, you know, so ingrained with that. But until recently, statistically, the largest number of people who had overstayed their visas were white people. White Americans, white Australians, white Europeans. Particularly folks who came here, who come as visitors, as young people, want to work in the ski resort industry, right, in particular, uh, you know, uh, an industry that is so directly complicit in the ongoing theft of indigenous lands. People want to work in the ski re industry resorts or in the ski industry, want to like hang out, you know, be chill, smoke, smoke a joint, drink beer, and, and work. Then they overstay their visas. They overstay their visitor visas. They overstay their, um, their work visas. And whenever a, a case comes up in the media of a white person who has 
illegally overstayed their visas, that case is always presented with so much sympathy, right? Like immigration is just this bureaucratic nightmare and people from the Commonwealth should be able to like equally, you know, cross borders and this, this young, you know, usually cisgendered white male just wants to like, just wants to hang out in Canada. Like what's wrong with that? You know, we need people, we need good, nice white Australians. Um, <laughs> but by contrast, of course, right? And we see this all the time. Whenever there is a case of brown and black folks, particularly, you know, Latino, poor, undocumented people who have overstayed their visas, they're instantly criminalized, right? Like in those instances, the law is not this bureaucratic force against them. In those instances, the law is the moral authority, and those folks are, are committing an illegal criminal act, right? So we see a really clear way in how race even defines the notion of, quote unquote, who is illegal, right? Where again, it is not, it is not simply a legal semantic debate about whether you're actually legally here or not. It's actually completely about, about race and racism. And this is, of course, similar to so many other discourses when we talk about race, right? Like we give so many examples, but the war on drugs is fundamentally a racial war on brown and black people, right? The war about, you know, the, the entire prison industrial complex, both in the United States and Canada, we don't talk about the prison industrial complex enough in Canada, but the prison industrial complex in both countries is completely predicated on a war on, on black bodies, on Latino bodies, and on indigenous bodies in particular. And the ways in which right now we're seeing, um, particularly in light of Ferguson, but of course, you know, beyond that and much before that, and, and will, you know, likely continue much beyond this time, we see that in the context of Ferguson, black bodies are inherently cast as suspicious regardless of whether any act has been committed, right? And the fact that there is a movement um, you know, around Black Lives Matter speaks so profoundly to how criminalized black bodies are, right? And not just black men, but black women, black youth, black transgendered folks, black queer folks in the context of the United States. And of course, in, in Canada, um, we see that with indigenous communities and with Latino communities as well, right? So 90% um, of, of women in prisons are indigenous women in Canada, right? And so we see the ways in which similar to how the, the so-called illegal is inherently racialized, whether or not that is statistically true or whether or not we know anything about it, similarly the war on drugs, the war on so-called criminals, um, all of these, you know, the war on terror, all of these different incarnations of war deploy racial tropes that inherently impact brown and black people. You know, sometimes through different systems and different logics, but are fundamentally racialized wars that are couched in legal rhetoric. Rhetoric, right? So, um, you know, I work in, in the downtown east side in, in Vancouver, which, you know, as folks probably know, is the poorest neighborhood in Canada. And every single day I can see, and, you know, Promsey can, can attest to this as well, every single day we see the very clearly differential way in which folks who are indigenous in particular are treated compared to white folks going through the criminal injustice system, right? Indigenous people are automatically seen and cast as, 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 cast as, as criminals, right? Which is what actually justifies over-incarceration. But we're led to believe the opposite. We're led to believe that communities that are over-incarcerated are over-incarcerated because they're inherently committing criminal acts rather than the other way around, which is that the system over-incarcerates and over-surveils certain communities. And that is the same logic at, at play on, on the war on immigrants. And right now, um, you know, talking about the prison industrial complex, the largest growing population of people incarcerated in Canada alongside indigenous women are migrant detainees. So with Harper's prison expansion plan, it's expected that the fastest growing segment of incarcerated people are migrant detainees and indigenous women. Um, with indigenous women, it's of course, you know, this legacy of colonization and over-incarceration of women living in, in poverty, right? Folks engaged in the survival sex trade, survival drug trade, um, and informal economies. In the case of migrants, it's people incarcerated for the, for the crime of supposedly trespassing an artificial border. Canada currently holds over 11,000 migrant detainees every single year. And migrant populations, most folks don't know this, you know, the criminal injustice system is fundamentally unjust. The immigration system, I would argue, is, is another layer of that, because the immigration system is the only system where you can incarcerate people without a specific criminal charge. So migrant detainees can be held from anywhere from two days to 10 years. And you have no idea how long you're gonna be held in detention. Right, so imagine that. Um, and you know, and, and, and horrific things happen in detention. People probably heard the recent, the recent case of Lucia Vega Jimenez who committed suicide in migrant detention, right, in, in BC. Um, 
And you know, an inquest showed that that just finished a coroner's inquest just showed like series after series of of a horror story, right? Of like migrant dungeons, literally no access to air, no telephone calls, um, over 20 hours in um, in segregation, in solitary confinement, no access to legal counsel, no access to interpreters. Um, you know, and in in the case of of Lucia, she asked for a mental health assessment, and the day that her mental health assessment was um, and and mental health support was scheduled for the prison actually showed her as having been released from detention, even though she was incarcerated three feet away from the guard looking at the computer system, right? Um, and so people die, you know, again, people die. People die as a result of incarceration, and people are being killed as a result of, of border violence. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about um, is the ways in which capitalism and labor relations are so fundamental to immigration. Um, you know, so it's, it's true that the war on migrants, um, parallel again, similar to other kinds of wars on brown and black bodies, is fundamentally a racial war. Um, but it is also true that it's not that Canada wants to deport and expel all racialized migrants. What I would argue is that Canada needs is that it needs migrants on its own terms, right? And that is historically always been, its own terms means cheap labor. That has always been the primary function that migrants have served in the, served in the Canadian economy, right? Like hearkening back to, to, to Chinese railway workers and the Chinese head tax and going on down. Um, and so capitalism plays a key role in how migration is defined because the state, serve, the state and capital collude to ensure that there's a pool of constant cheap labor. And so, you know, here we have this, this seeming contradiction, right? Which is that the Canadian state and Canadians often in general, um, this white supremacist society, really wants to maintain white Canada, whether people admit it or not, right? This legacy of white Canada, right? This idea of like who belongs and where are you from, all of this underpins this idea of white Canada. Um, and so it wants to maintain this white supremacy and white hegemony, but how does it do that when it also needs cheap labor? Right? How does it do that? And so the way that it does that, um, because what it, needs, what it needs cheap labor means it also needs brown and black bodies, right? So it doesn't want us, but it kind of wants us. What do we do? What does the state do? Um, so the state devises you know, programs like the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is critical to resolving this contradiction between wanting to maintain a white Canada, but absolutely needing <laughs> brown and black labor in particular. Um, and so it's not true that Canada wants to deport all people. It just wants to make sure that migrants are constantly in a vulnerable state, in a precarious state, um, in a state of extreme indentured servitude. So the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, um, I want to mention for a few reasons. One is because you know it resolves this contradiction that I mentioned, but also because it is actually actually the model that other countries want to implement. So when people think that Canada has this liberal, humane immigration policy, that you know we don't have massive um, immigration raids like the ones we see in the United States, part of that reason is because Canada has actually perfected a system of managed migration that the United States hasn't yet. Right? And the United States has consistently looked to Canada's temporary foreign worker program as its model to implement. So Canada is not the liberal counterpoint. Canada is the perfected model that other Western colonial settler states want to implement. And what this program is, you know, it has a long history, um, but it's essentially a program of indentured servitude. It's where workers come in on temporary permits, um, work for a single employer. You can't change employers. Your employer owns you, right? Every single migrant worker that I've ever talked to, or if you ever read the words of any, any migrant worker who's going to be writing or speaking about this program, they call it a form of modern day slavery, right? And that is, that's not used lightly because you are owned by your employer. Um, Canada currently accepts more people under TFWP, this program that I'm talking about, than permanent residents, right? Which is a direct challenge to this myth of Canadian multiculturalism, we welcome immigrants, la la la, right? Um, it's not true. So Canada accepts more people under this program, which is a, a program of indentured labor, labor um, and people are, are working in horrific conditions. So um, you, you have to work for an employer, you have no right to unionize. You have no access to health and safety standards. You have no access to basic labor standards. Um, in the case of farm workers, you pay into EI, so you subsidize EI for the Canadian population, but you can't access it yourself. Um, there is no enforcement of minimum wage, right? So people are often working for way less than minimum wage. You work for at least 18 hours a day, if not more. You live with your employer. Not only do you ha are you forced to an indenture to a single employer, you work for your employer. You live with your employer. In the case of the Living Caregiver Program, which is like 98% Filipino women, over 80% of women in that program report rape and sexual violence. 
That is astoundingly high, right? And this is state-sanctioned gendered violence. The state knows that this happens. The state has created a program which inherently makes migrant women vulnerable to rape and sexual violence, right? This is state-sanctioned sexual violence that is occurring on the bodies of over 80% of Filipino women coming under the Living Caregiver Program. Um, you know, and, and everyone who comes under the Migrant Worker Program reports similar conditions of horrific violence and abuse. Um, your travel documents are confiscated. In the case of, you know, migrant workers in Ontario, some of them have been coming for three generations. So there's nothing temporary about this. It's precarious, but it's not temporary because you're actually coming, in some cases, for like 20 years, right? Um, and in the cases of, of those folks who've been coming for so many years, you know, they report, in some cases, not having even stepped foot outside of the farm worker compound that they're forced to live in, other than to go to one grocery store. Imagine living in a community where that is all you have seen for 20 years, right? You're held captive. Um, one of the farms that I visited, people lived, there was 32 men in an area that's like the equivalent of this section, living in this much room. So they actually all physically slept on top of each other. Um, and you know, a lot of, so employers also set rules, right? Employers set arbitrary rules. So you know, one of the rules on one of the farms is no alcohol. So completely constrained in what you're allowed to do. You're not allowed to have alcohol. You know, and also playing into, you know, again, the ways in which you know, feminism, particularly white feminism, is used. Um, you know, a lot of these men, there's explicit rules by some of these employers saying that they cannot fraternar fraternize? Fraternize? fraternize with white women, specifically. Right? So you cannot bring back white women and you cannot be seen with white women in the community, right? Because it plays into the, 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 the trope of the dangerous brown man, right? Who's going to, um, you know, who's going to violate uh, the, the civility of white women. And so we see how this plays in. And similarly, the live-in caregiver program that I was talking to, that I was talking about, uh, of domestic workers, Filipina domestic workers, there's also you know, a deep complicity of, of white feminists in that program as well, right? Because as white feminists, or middle class feminists in particular, laud their entry into the workforce, it's never acknowledged that their entry into the workforce is completely subsidized by this kind of reproductive domestic labor. Right on the backs of Filipina women who are subsidizing middle class entry into the workforce. Um, and it also absolves the state and it absolves the white feminist middle class movement of actually advocating for things like universal child care, right? Because they don't need universal child care. So then we have you know, indigenous, brown, black, single mamas, poor mamas, working mamas who are struggling to find child care who are struggling to make ends meet and who have to fight for a universal child care system on their own. Right? Because a whole other segment of you know, white feminist society, middle class society, has this privatized labor force that's doing their childcare labor for them. Right? Um, and this is really important to note because, again, the, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program operates in a number of different ways to, to create um, a relationship of social relationships and economic relationships and gendered relationships amongst Canadian society, right? And to be clear, migrant workers, even though they're deemed temporary, they're in our communities, right? Even though we are in, their, whole, their, whole their whole signifier as foreign and temporary is so profoundly racist and alienating because they're actually living amongst us. They're working in our homes, right? Many, there might, I don't know, this university probably hires temporary foreign workers because there's, you know, there's temporary foreign workers everywhere, right? Um, so to even cast them as foreigners reproduces the violence against them in which we don't see them as part of our communities when in fact they are. Um, and also, you know, right now we're seeing the, the temporary foreign worker program um, is in the media a lot, right? Where we're seeing that even progressive people, progressive responses, including union responses to the temporary foreign worker program is like, well, let's just abolish this program because temporary foreign workers are stealing Canadian jobs, right? And that's a deeply nationalist, racist, protectionist idea because it's this idea that immigrants are stealing Canadian jobs. That's a really old trope, right? Like the Chinatown riots across the West Coast was predicated on this really racist trope of immigrants stealing labor. Um, when in fact the reality is, is you know, I, I would argue the much more appropriate response is, is how do we organize in solidarity with temporary workers? How do we fight for migrant workers to have really basic rights that most people take for granted, right? How do we fight for something like status upon landing? Right, so that people aren't precarious, so that people have permanent rights of residency. Um, 
you know, and then although citizenship is, of course, a completely constructed reality, the reality is, is that people who don't have it are forced into these positions of indentured labor, right? So it's so necessary to argue for people to have permanent status on these lands. Um, so in terms of what I want to end with is, you know, responses to border imperialism. So now that if we look at the ways in which borders are, are navigated and deployed against people in such fund, in, you know, ways that, that implicate race and gender and capital and labor and empire and all of these different border systems, what are ways in which we can respond, right? Like what would it, what would it look like to undo border imperialism? Um, and so what I want to end with is, you know, something that's, that's quite simple, I think, you know, and that's the notion of, of no human being is illegal. So like I said, I, I'm part of a movement called No One is Illegal. And for me, the evocation of that even is so profound in, a multiple, in multiple ways, right? The first is um, we have to reject the idea and delink the idea of migrants as being tied to the economy, right? Because the ways in which migration policy has worked for so long is to link migrants to the economy and to treat migrants as economic units, our responses cannot continue to play into that logic, right? Um, and I'm not in any way devaluing that migrants have played a critical role within this economic structure, right? It is absolutely true that the economy of Canada is built on stolen labor and stolen land, right? The economy of Canada is not built by politicians. It's not built by whoever the so-called founding fathers are. It's not built by banks. It's not built by corporations. It's based on the theft of indigenous land that continues to subsidize this economy. And it's built on stolen labor, predominantly of migrant labor, reproductive labor, slave labor, or prison labor, right? This is the stolen labor and the stolen land this economy is based on, that people talk about this economy, right, about who's built it. These are the bodies and the people who have built it and the lands that have built it. So although it is absolutely true that migrants have played a critical role in the economic structuring of Canada, I don't think our responses can feed into that, though, right? Because that is what the state wants. The state wants migrants to continue to be commodified as economic units. Um, and you know we're not we're not pawns in an economic system. And fundamentally, I think any social justice movement that finds its humanizing force based on performance in the wage labor market also leaves a whole lot of people out. What does that say for people who aren't performing in the wage labor market, right? What does it say primarily and, and foremost about indigenous land defenders? right, who are stewarding the land, who don't perform and actively reject the capitalist economy? What does it say about single mothers who are cast as unproductive and not contributing to the wage economy, but in fact are reproducing labor power and reproductive power every single day and doing like the hardest job on the planet, right? What does it say about folks who are differently abled or disabled, right, who aren't performing or functioning, supposedly functioning in the wage economy? but again, are contributing to our societies and our communities in so many different ways, right? So when we, when we continue to use um, the economy as our humanizing force and we see ourselves um, as people who only contribute to the economy, then we run the risk of pitting people against each other who don't perform in the same way, who either don't or refuse to or can't, whatever the reasons might be. Um, and so for me, you know, this idea of no one is legal and refusing to be commodified in the economy is also important to also then refuse the idea of who's, you know, this, the corollary to that is to refuse the idea of who's a good migrant and who's a bad migrant, right? So the good migrant isn't, you know, what the state wants us to do is to say the good migrant is the one who, you know, will perform in the economy, will be the model minority, who will get a job, who's English speaking, heteronuclear, doesn't have a criminal record, la 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 la, right? Like all of the markers of power. And the undesirable migrant is the one who doesn't fit any of those, right? Has a criminal record, um, is a single mother, has, you know, tending to six kids at home, doesn't speak English, all of the diff, all of the, and the antithesis of that, right? Um, and what we're essentially doing when we're creating this idea of who's desirable and who's undesirable, both as migrants in the migrant justice movement, but in our communities and societies at large, is we're basically decide we're becoming border agents, right? We're becoming the border agent in deciding and determining who is worthy of our support, who is worthy of freedom, who is worthy of self-determination. Um, and you know, there's a, a quote from Gloria Anzaldúa, the, the Chicana activist, who says that borders and walls that are supposed to keep undesirables out are entrenched habits and patterns of behavior. 
And I think that implicates not only the state in perpetuating border violence, but also calls on us to undo all the ways in which we reproduce exclusionary ideas, right? And ways in which we reproduce ideas of who's worthy, who are we allying with, who are we alongside um, in any of our movements, right? Particularly in the migrant justice movement, but in all movements. And so for me, the idea of, of no one is illegal is a rejection of that idea of who's desirable and who's undesirable. Um, it, it squarely places responsibility on the state rather than on migrants to prove their desirability. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, for us in Coast Salish territories, um, lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people, no one is legal there. For us, it's really important to center also the notion of no one is illegal, Canada is illegal, which is to, again, squarely place settler colonialism at, at our core understanding of, of border violence, and to really refuse acquiescence into power, right? One of the ways in which migrants, we as migrants, for those who identify as such, one of the ways in which we internalize, um, you know, internalize border imperialism, if you will, is this idea of being grateful, right? We're supposed to be grateful to the Canadian nation state. We're supposed to be grateful for people to let us, you know, uh, to the Canadian state for letting us in, for letting us work here, for residing here, all of those things, you know? And so for me, I always say I'm a completely ungrateful immigrant. I have nothing to be grateful for. I'm not grateful to the Canadian state or to empire for displacing my people. I'm not grateful to Canadian capital for displacing my mother from her land. I am not grateful to Canadian empire and Canadian imperialism um, and Canadian racism for forcing subjugation on my family, right? But I am grateful to indigenous nations. I am grateful to the host laws of these lands that steward these lands. And for me, for very directly and concretely, when I was under a deportation order for years, the communities that took me in were Ganyangahaga communities on the East Coast, right? And so, um, you know, and I think that is also a really critical idea for me, which is that in our rejection of the Canadian nation state, how are we also prefiguring our relationships? to each other, but primarily and, fo and foremost as migrants of color to indigenous nations? How are we enacting and embodying and learning about indigenous host laws when we reject Canadian state laws, right? Um, and that's also the, you know, for me, that idea of no one is legal and Canada is legal in some of the organizing that we do, which is to reject state power and reject state violence, but to also prefigure alternative ways of being in this world where we're in responsibility to each other, in responsibility in relationship to indigenous nations, and in responsibility to the land that we all have an obligation to steward based on indigenous host laws that we live under. Um, and so what I want to end with is a quote by um, Eduardo Galeano. And Eduardo Galeano said that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone, right? And so how do we create communities and how do we create movements where everybody has a home? Where people whose homes we're residing on have the first right to their homelands? How do all people have a right to their homelands? The right to return to their homelands in the case of Palestinian refugees. The right to not be dispossessed and displaced from one's homelands in the first place. How do we build homes alongside others in respectful ways? Right? How do people find home in their bodies and their gender identities and their sexual identities so that everyone feels at home and can fully be themselves and bring themselves to our communities and to our movements? Right? How do we fully feel at home with one another so that we can look at each other and recognize each other and see each other fully? Right? How do we build that idea of home? Um, and so for me, that, that notion of building home and resistance and community together, um, and how do we build homes in ways that are respectful to the land, that idea of building homes is so central to how we undo border imperialism um, in the ways in which we relate to one another, right? Is, is central to this idea of building home. And so um, I wanna end it with that and you know, look forward to how, how we can build home together. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call upon uh, two people right now to come up and, and, and join Harsha at the table, uh, and they'll do a few comments. Uh, and I, they are Joanne Lee, who is an associate professor in the Department of Women's Studies, who trained as a sociologist. Her research focuses on anti-racist, decolonizing feminist theory and practice. She has a background in adult education, community development, and organizing with women and girls in urban settings. She writes and research in the area of immigrant women, North American Asian feminisms, and Asian Canadian um, 
sorry, feminist, feminist participatory, participatory research and girlhood studies. Uh, I'd also like to call on Sharmarki Mohammed, uh, who works with refugee and immigrant youth in Victoria at Virx, the v Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Center Society. He was born in Somalia and spent over five years working with asylum seekers, migrants, and refugees in the Middle East, where he worked with several organizations and as a research assistant at the Center for Migration, Refugee studies at American University in Cairo. He also currently sits on the Canadian Council for Refugee Steering Committee and is Vice President of the Victoria Coalition for Survivors of Torture. Since coming to Canada in June 2012, he has been actively involved with refugee issues and migrant justice in Canada. So we have a few words from them and then we'll open up uh, to, to questions. I loved your talk. It was absolutely amazing. It was wonderful. What a gift. Thank you so much. It's the book that I've been, I've been reading your book, and I haven't put it down for the last three days, so it's wonderful. And if you haven't read the book, you have to, you have to get it. Um, you, you haven't talked about it. You've talked about um, really the opening chapter, the border imperialism part. But the part of it that I really, really, really appreciated was the... Um, it is turned on. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So the part, the part of the book that I really, really appreciated was um, the detailed um, analysis uh, that you gave of movement, on the ground movement organizing. And I really appreciated um, the stories you gathered. That chapter on the round table really spoke a lot to me because it really revealed the diversity, the complexity of um, what people were dealing with on the ground and, and the strategies and tactics and how personal those struggles are. And you yourself spoke from that perspective, a, a really grounded um, personal experience that you um, you understood so clearly as situated within uh, the legacy of co colonization and white settler nation formation. And that's, that's really hard intellectual work, and I really appreciated that. Um, I guess if I had a question to ask you, um, as somebody who's done a lot of organizing, grassroots organizing myself, um, the, the really the hardest emotional um, a challenge that I face is the criticism from within our own communities. And you talked about the years and years where you had to take it on the chin from your aunties for doing what you were doing and being a um, kind of um, kick-ass girl. So I wondered if you could talk you know, a little bit about how it felt, how you got over it, and any suggestions that you have for the rest of us. I mean, I'm pretty old now, so <laughs> I'm gonna put, up, put, put away my uh, organizing hat, I think. But um, for those of us who are coming along from minority communities, being um, you know, um, brown, black, women of color, feminists, who are trying to defend feminism within our communities, but also at the same time struggle against patriarchy and white supremacy outside. It's a complicated world to negotiate. Can you just say a few words about that? Should I answer that, or are you gonna be speaking? Oh, please go ahead. Should I should answer? Okay. Thank you for that, thank you for those kind words. Um, Oh, criticism within communities. <laughs> so much of it. <laughs> Can folks here relate to that? Or folks in organizing feel really isolated? Yeah, in your, whatever your community, however one defines that. Um, how to deal with it. I mean, this is like a really random, the first thing on the tip of my tongue, which is that um, I actually giggle a lot. So <laughs> whenever I get scolded by aunties and uncles, I tend to just giggle it off. And then they think I agree with them. That's like, <laughs> that's a really superficial answer. Um, in terms of, but in, I guess in a more serious way, uh, I think a lot of it for me has been two main kind of at least personal strategies around it. Um, the first is continuing just really vehemently believing and somehow holding on to the idea um, that when we have a principled analysis that comes from our grounded experience, particularly in naming colonialism and patriarchy and racism, um, 
and, and doing that within our communities, uh, that, that's just fundamentally the right thing to do. Um, and also the same for outside of our communities, um, because I think one of the challenges that I face, and maybe others do too, which is how do we make the words that we say and the principles that we come to our work with and the challenges that we offer to different communities is how, you know, one of the things we face is how do you water it down, right? This idea of like what you're saying is, is too strong, it's too harsh, um, people don't want to hear it, um, and you're like, you're this fringe person, right? Like you don't represent anybody but yourself and maybe a few other people. Um, and so for me, it's just been the, the notion that, you know, sometimes the things that are unpopular are only said by minority of people until they become more popular, right? And really holding on to that idea that, you know, the, the truth, whatever that personal truth is and that analytical truth is and that grounded truth is, is ultimately the most important thing. I know that sounds vague, but it's just this like repeated mantra a little bit. Um, and the second thing is actually continuing to be really relevant within communities. So I know for me, in the context of the Punjabi community, for example, it took like over seven or eight years till folks took the organizing of No One Is Legal seriously. And by that, I mean, you know, not just No One Is Legal as a movement, but, you know, also this understanding and framework of indigenous sovereignty and anti-capitalist and, and anti and anti-empire. Um, and it took a lot of persistent just like being present in community and showing up for people um, when then people start to take you seriously. So it's unfortunate because you, you do have to prove yourself, right? Which is like the antithesis of what you're trying to organize against, which is that people shouldn't have to prove themselves to be taken seriously. Um, but that ends up being a little bit of the reality that you have to prove yourself in community. But I think that's, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, which is that we all have an obligation to serve community and to win the trust of our communities um, and to be present in, in responsible ways. And so I think that was a second thing. You know, and so it's gone from, at least in the context of the Punjabi community, where there was a time like in 2005 or 6, um, where a number of Punjabi radio stations would say that, you know, no one is legal, was on Canada's official terrorist list, um, and would say that I was on Canada's terrorist list, <laughs> and that no one should listen to me. Um, so, you know, and that, not that it's about me, but all of those, you know, other people had similar experiences in, in their cultural communities. Um, to, you know, now decades later, or a decade later, where it, in the context of the Punjabi community, um, you know, organizers with No One Is Legal have a, you know, a constant spot on radio stations and, you know, write for, for Punjabi language media. Um, and not only us doing that, but that those those media outlets have taken on the struggles that we're trying to bring forward, right? So, um, you know, for the past three years, there's at least two radio stations in the Punjabi community in Vancouver who, on a weekly basis, um, highlight indigenous struggles, right? And and that's that's not just because of our work, that's a lot of people's work, but I think there's um, a, con you know, we bring that shift about even within our own communities and this idea of, you know, we also bring people along. Um, and so I think that's another key part, which is just this consistent to make ourselves relevant and more importantly to make our politics relevant and then people people do come forward um, and right now in the context of the South Asian community there's there's always this push and pull particularly around the question of patriarchy and domestic violence and how people respond and engage with that but you know there was recently an incident of, of domestic violence um, in the South Asian community and it was um, it was incredibly. I mean, whenever there's a case of domestic violence involving brown folks, it's always high profile because race is always the, the primary defining factor of that story. But in this case, even more so because the act was committed by the president of a gurdwara, a, a, a Sikh religious um, institution, um, and his his wife was murdered. And this was one of the first times in in recent memory uh, where every single um, gurdwara actually came out quite strong. Um, to oppose this act of domestic violence. And it's shameful to say that prior to that, people hadn't. A lot of times before, it was like, well, we don't really know, and we're sorry she lost her life, but never named it as a sexist patriarchal act. Um, and this time they did, and that came as a result of you know, a lot of pressure internal to the community by um, you know, South Asian women and Punjabi women really forcing these spaces to, to take on a much clearer feminist lens in response to domestic violence. So I'm not, I guess I'm not really answering it other than suggesting that it's a, it's a process um, and the ways in which we engage is defined by you know, the process more so than the goal.
Ah, thank you very much for. Can you hear me? Okay. Being tall is not easy, you know. Even the <laughs> mic. <laughs> uh, I I really want to thank you and listening to you just blowed my mind. You know, I was sitting at that corner and trying to reflect all the things you said, and is is something I will definitely take on and think about it. And I was invited to give comment, especially what is happening in Victoria and when people come, especially the newcomers and what services are for there. And before I talk about that, which I'm sure you already know, I, I would like to talk about a bit of what you said and connect to that. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I, I came June 2012 uh, in Canada as as private sponsor Ruvigi. And coming to Canada, one of the things I have noticed, as any other newcomer would notice, was the politeness, and that comes with the silence. Mm -hmm. And when it comes with that silence, then people will not be able to have such difficult conversations. And that is something I personally struggle with coming with uh, and my own background. Oh, I will, thank you. Uh, in, in terms of borders, I mean, when I was eight years old, uh, I challenged borders through the sea, crossing from Somalia to Kenya. Then I challenged borders through the land from Somalia, uh, Kenya to Ethiopia, then through the air to North Africa. So I myself have challenged borders in a different way. But coming here is, is you've mentioned one of your talks how we are going more economic and moving more on generally welcoming Canada with all type of people, and you mentioned illegal. But for me, I want to go back to use the language of the government, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> and we hear on the TV or, or on the news is bogus Ruvigi, genuine Ruvigi, and who uh, deserves to be Canada, who doesn't deserve to be Canada. So I, I, I have here an, a summary of the minister, the former minister, Jenny, uh, had, they were looking into the, the Ruvigi resettlement program and how they would change because it was global context of bringing people from overseas. So how would we change that for targeted audiences in a target uh, geography and again, tied bit with economically. And you've mentioned Afghanistan. The reason why I mentioned this was in the, in the memo, one of the things where they, they've raised about Somalis, Iraqis, Afghanis, and Palestine later on. And especially Iraqis, Somalis, and Afghanis where they were like, UNHCR recommended in 2012 to and to the Canadian government to bring Somali refugees, Iraq refugees, but somehow the previous minister rejected in terms of, because the same thing you said, integration and more economically integrated. And then for me as a newcomer being in Somalia, and then I would, I looked into it, I mean, to, to see the history of why a certain countries Although the UNHCR said these are the highest and high priority because the government asked it priorities of refugees that will be resettled. And one of the reasons were because they can't be locally integrated. But to begin with, when they came in the 90s, there were issue of IDs, as you know. They were not issued permanent residents, and they couldn't have normal IDs because they come from civil war, so their passports and IDs were not accepted. So they were in a limbo situation for 15 years, 10 years, so they didn't work. So now to assess that, then to say that because they are on social benefit, 
we can bring them, then that for me was a part that really touched me. Mm -hmm. But to come back as, mm -hmm. now I'm speaking the name of the agency, and that was my previous uh, comment, is that there has been a lot of cuts in terms of uh, funding for s programs that and permanent residents and refugee claimants and private sponsored or government sponsored refugees. And there were so many pilot programs and there haven't been any consistency. There will be one pilot program, then there will be the resource, then you get the trust and the connection with the community, then that program doesn't be funded and the funding doesn't continue. And and in 2013, the BC government, and I mean, you could say that most of the programs were funded by the BC government. Now they repatriated back to the federal. So that means anything that has to do with settlement and agencies, now the federal government and fund this. And we are limited who we could serve. So now we have two groups legible and eligible. Uh, we have legible, like if you're permanent residents, then, uh, or refugee claimant, which got the result, then we could help you. If you're a naturalized citizen, for instance, if you are youth who went to India, who became citizen, then come back after two, 10, 15 years, as a newcomer, we can't help them. Uh, refugee claimants, we can't help them. Foreign workers, we can't help them. Migrants, we can't help them. I, I, I just want to show everybody how limited we are. One of the programs that were very successful we had was the citizenship program. Mm -hmm. And you know that Citizen Act has been changing now. And the imagine that not only answering uh, the, uh, the guide of the new guide for the citizenship, but uh, having language uh, barrier, and the fees, and then knowing the history of Canada uh, <laughs> and all that. So we, we had a very successful program where we were helping people to prepare them, at least they could yeah. pass. There, there's a case where a youth uh, quit the job and quit high school so he could, uh, I mean, he dropped out of high school so he can have two jobs, so he can support his mother, so she would be able to fulfill the money to apply the citizenship. And again, she has mental health issues where she cannot memorize or her English level is not level four. So the program was preparing people not as language but as the, uh, the knowledge test. Mm -hmm. So the pilot program has finished mm -hmm. but there is no continue and people are calling mm -hmm. for the program. So that's one thing I, I wanted to mention. And the other thing is that for the limiting of programs was the refugee claimants. I mean as now there is talk that they want to even cut the social benefit mm -hmm and that they receive because when you were waiting for your refugee hearing, then how are you gonna leave? Because you, you run away from conflict, displacement, and you've mentioned all the reasons. But then when you come here while you're waiting your hearing, then you don't have social benefit, then where do you live? Then we create other homeless. And I just wanna highlight on that and uh, thank you so much. Uh, open it up for questions now. I'll just bring the mics up there. Uh, could you please ask your question into a mic uh, so that everybody can hear you? You're welcome to address your questions to any three at the table. Hi. Um, I really appreciated tonight hearing from all three of you, but I was just thinking of something that, um, that you just mentioned about the whole citizenship piece, and it's on the top of my mind, so I thought I'd put it out there to the three of you. I find it interesting with uh, 
these citizenship tests and classes to, that people have to go through, because to me, the citizenship test is actually, the studying that occurs for it is actually what we want to work against. It's perpetuating a story of Canada that isn't true, and it's sort of ironic that then we're just perpetuating that system by, f by filling the heads of newcomers with this misinformation. So I guess my question would be, I don't even know where you start with making changes, right? Because when you're teaching a class like that and you're aware that there's an imbalance and there's other things that need to be taught around what happened in Canada and what is happening in Canada, how do you reconcile the two things? And when you're in that environment, because I have a friend who works in that area and she struggled quite a bit with that piece. So just some comments, if you have any. I can only answer in terms of the program, the, and I will leave the other piece for you. <laughs> and in terms of the program, of course, there is a limitation. Um, I mean, if I merely speak of the program, the limitation is the indigenous. I mean, even if you read the book, you could see that there's so much is missing it in terms of the history, in terms of other things. But this is specific program because people already want to become citizens, and they, they really want to give and be loyal to the country. And we were fortunate enough to have such a program. So the program only didn't help them know about the knowledge test, but also how to become active citizen within the discussions. We invite several people, talk about the indigenous people and other things that might not have the guide itself. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking about citizenship. Um, you know, as I mentioned, so I was under removal order for years and then suddenly got this thing that was like, you can now be a citizen. And I was like, oh shit, what does this mean? Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know how other folks feel, particularly people who are, who are challenging really directly the, the notion of, of citizenship. But for me, how I've reconciled it, if you will, is that citizenship is like many other struggles where you, you know, your survival is dependent on the state, right? It is not that different than many other struggles where people, um, you know, anti-colonial struggles, anti-imperialist struggles, where while confronting the state, the reality is, is that your survival is dependent on it. Um, you know, and that's true for indigenous folks too, people dealing with the prison system, child welfare system, and you know, many other systems, and it's true for migrants. The reality is, is that our survival is similarly dependent on the state in regards to citizenship. So for me, I see citizenship as like survival pending revolution. That's what I see it as. I don't see citizenship as like, you know, I now have a Canadian passport. I'm not loyal to, the, <laughs> to my Canadian passport, um, but it's a strategic necessity for me to be able to not face a deportation order. Um, and so in terms of, you know, and so for me, that's one piece, right? It's much more important, like, which is what do we do on the ground? What do we do on the ground to reject citizenship? What do we do on the ground to build a notion of that's, you know, anti-citizen, but an alternative idea of what does it mean to participate in our communities? Um, you know, and there's lots of folks running who have to run these state-sanctioned programs who are doing really interesting things with it. Like in Toronto, I know there was the Brown Canada Project. Um, that a number of quote unquote settlement service providers did, which was, you know, having to run a citizenship course and, you know, one of the, the many immigration settlement courses, but completely, you know, did what they had to do in order to make sure people passed, of course, but ran this amazing project called Brown Canada, which was looking at, well, what is the racialized histories of Canada, particularly with regards to settler colonialism? Um, and so I think there are many interesting and amazing ways in which people are subverting. Um, and challenge and using that space to challenge against what citizenship means, especially in this context where the citizenship test has been completely rewritten, not only to erase settler colonialism, but also to completely glorify Canada's military history. Like more than 30% of Canada's citizenship guide is on Canada's military history, right? And so you have people, you know, learning about the War of 1812 and all of this stuff, right? Um, and so I do think, so for me, the reconciliation is when we see it as a tactic rather than a vision, it looks completely different. And I, for me, that's generally, um, you know, it's part of a much broader debate and question, which is like around reform and revolution, right? Which is how do we engage the state while trying to turn away and reject the state? And it's like, well, our vision can be one, and it doesn't preclude the other. 
especially when, again, to reiterate, when people are surviving, when people's survival depends on the state, right? We don't always have the luxury to reject it. But we can, I do think it is not contradictory to reject the state in our vision and our practice and continue to realize that the state is a necessary tactic to engage in um, to win those really basic necessities for people. Well, I think that um, immigrant settlement agencies themselves have to be decolonized. Uh, they are a tool. They have become a tool and an, uh, uh, an extension of the state apparatus. So citizenship courses within those kinds of agencies are already co-opted and compromised. So the idea of movement strategies and tactics is to do some of the things that you've done is to create alternative parallel uh, structures to do the same thing, but in a, in a resistant court sort of way, a, a conscious, mindful sort of way that is from an anti-imperial decolonizing perspective. I don't know if many of you know, but um, 300 uh, people, students from Vancouver Community College um, came over to the legislature buildings today. I think it was today that they came over to um, protest the cuts to English language training programs. I mean, the, it, it, neoliberalism is hard at work. Uh, those groups who um, migrate here from, you know, not former British colonies are at a huge disadvantage um, because they will never be able to gain the language skills that they need to get further training, to move further up the employment ladder, um, to write the tests for citizenship. And so, you know, uh, I do not see that they're going to win this this sortie, this battle, using the war terms. Instead, what will have to happen is that solidarity work needs to be done on the ground so that maybe students uh, can organize free English language classes with competent, certified teachers. This is not to be a second-rate, second-tier training program, but as you say, we've got to move it, move ahead. And the first... The first rule of any subordinated person is to survive. And English is absolutely necessary to survive. So I think this is another, another front in the battle. Yeah. I just to add in terms of you're correct, there's no consistency. In one side, you're saying that to pass the citizenship, you have to have a level four. On the other side, then you're cutting the ESL programs that exist. So there's no consistency. <laughs> Hello. Um, first, of all, hi, Joanne. <laughs> Um, it's such a pleasure to see so many people up there that I so greatly admire. I think I'd sooner see you across my kitchen table, but I'll take it. Um, Harsha, your last point really resonated with me about rejecting gratefulness and um, prefiguring relationships specifically in the context of this land. Um, I guess my question in the context of the no one illegal movement, no one is illegal movement, is how, um, how to build accessible movements. Um, in my communities of mostly Filipinas, something that we really come up against and struggle with is um, resisting the idea of gratefulness, but that that's not necessarily accessible for um, having intergenerational conversations and specifically moving conversations away from the university or policy or anything like that. Um, and so I'm wondering how, how to be gentle in that and also how we can support Indigenous nationhood and how to make that education accessible. Um, and again, move away from this dialogue of gratefulness and yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess there's a couple pieces in there, so um, thank you. Around the gratefulness, yeah, for me it's more, like when I talk about rejecting gratefulness, I talk about it more in terms of rejecting the politics of gratefulness and respectability, if you will. 
and the forms in which it takes will definitely look community specific, language specific, you know, culturally specific, et cetera. Um, it's kind of funny because, <laughs> give me an example of my dad. <laughs> So my so you know it took me years as I mentioned to get you know my landed status here or my my papers here. Um, my parents came after I did just a year and a half ago. Um, they just squeezed in past you know I don't know if people know but the conservatives really clamped down on parent and grandparent sponsorship right. So my parents kind of squeezed in during that time. So you know they're now here, um, and they will hear. This is how quickly they've, they've internalized gratefulness is where I'm going with this. So they'll hear stories on the news of, you know, Jason Kenney and other Tories or just, you know, racist media pundits going on and on about how seniors and senior immigrants are draining the public health care system. And my dad, who hates the Western medical system but goes to doctors anyway, mostly to give them a hard time. He's like in his 80s, right? So he's one of those folks, he's like, I don't know what to do, I'm gonna go to the doctor. And he goes like all the time. He's like the person that they are talking about. <laughs> and he will like sit in front of the TV and be like, those immigrant seniors are not grateful. They're like draining the public health care system, right? Like that is how quickly he has internalized the idea that like, he is grateful and other people are ungrateful, even though he is the person they're talking about. Um, and so I use that example because he is like, you know, he is a mirror of so many other people, which is that many people who internalize the idea of gratefulness don't realize that we, they are the ones who are actually being targeted and have been targeted for a really long time. So obviously, you know, when I'm talking to my dad, I'm not like, you need to reject the idea of, of blah, 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 right? Rhetorically, but it's just like, you know, those conversations, which is like, what exactly are you grateful for? Right, so there are of course things, you know, so for me, like when I talk about what I'm grateful for, I'm not grateful to have been under a removal order for years. I'm not grateful, you know, like for all those reasons that I said. So when I say it, it's not rhetorical. Like I am grateful for the nations that, that welcomed me when they did. Um, and you know, in the context of the South Asian community, it, specifically at least to the lower mainland, there is a long history parallel to this idea of, for example, the South Asian model minority, which is, you know, increasingly true, but also a myth, because there's this long history of South Asian resistance to really clear examples of exploitation and racism, right? Like the Canadian Farm Workers Union, for example, was started by South Asian farm workers who were being exploited and faced racism every single day, right? And so in those kinds of conversations, you realize that, that right under the surface of the gratefulness is a really real experience of racism that people are not grateful for, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say is in terms of talking to people, it's just allowing the space to people share their stories um, and share their experiences of, of marginalization because, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I do think the idea of gratefulness is one that we internalize. It's one that we tell ourselves, but we all know that it's not true, <laughs> right? That we experience marginalization in so many ways, particularly for folks who don't represent capital, right? Like, it's not necessarily true for people who represent capital and who are business investors, et cetera, but for like everyday working, you know, working class folks of color, that's not the experience. And so um, I guess for me that gentleness comes through that conversation, comes through that process of relationship building and, you know, intergenerational dialogue where it's not like, I'm going to tell you how you feel. It's more like, I want to hear how you experienced Canada and what, you know, what can, how can we build strength and resistance and unity in that experience that you had. Um, and in terms of the, I think there's three questions, but I'm only remembering two. There's one around indigenous nationhood. Building accessible movements. So building accessible movements. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> Um, you know, I feel like there's probably folks in this room who can, who can speak to how we build accessible movements, right? I don't think, I mean, accessibility is so many layers. It looks different for different people. Um, to me, the, the, the core of building accessible movements is, of course, first of all, a commitment to it. Um, second of all, I do, you know, I think there's a, a bit of a, a push and pull with the idea of accessibility. You know, one idea of accessibility is that movements have to be accessible to all people. Um, and I think that is true, but to me that is not the same as all people will be comfortable in movements. Um, that movements are also a space of challenge and of critique um, and you know, particularly pushing on, on questions of, of power and privilege and oppression, right? And so we see the ways in which safe space, for example, has been used in multiple ways. Oftentimes, of course, safe space is used in order to hold up folks who have who've experienced oppression, but a lot of times safe space has been used to silence folks. 
who experience depression. So for me, um, creating accessible spaces, first of all, requires clarity on who we want the movement to be accessible for. Who do we want the movement to be in leadership role? Like, who do we want in leadership roles in our movements, right? Um, so for, for me, that's, I think, the primary, that's the first question. And from that, different things will flow. Um, because through that, we, we then prioritize different voices in different communities. Um, because I don't, I think we can be inclusive to all as broader movements, but I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think we can have this, like, let's all love each other in all moments and all times and everyone will be happy. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, we have to have that push and pull and we have to be clear and principled about who we're centering in our movements. Um, I think for me that's a key part of accessibility in addition to the very, you know, to the other pieces around accessibility, right? Like making sure that our, our spaces are physically accessible, financially accessible, accessible through language, et cetera. Um, and the question around um, building alliances and working alongside indigenous communities and indigenous nations, I mean, that's like such a long answer or, or not even an easy answer. Um, I mean, I think again, similarly, first it's like a really clear, it has to be a clear um, principle to commit to that. And I mean that very seriously because I think a lot of folks, and you know, I'm not excluding myself from this because we're all constantly learning and, and going through this process together. Um, I think a lot of times indigenous sovereignty issues have been, and historically even more so, have been tacked on as a corollary to social justice movements, right? So particularly in environmental movements, it's this sense of like, oh, we want to save this forest. Oh, look, indigenous people want to save this forest. Like, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and so for me, um, particularly for migrants of color, and it comes back to this idea of like, you know, how do we decolonize our understanding of Canada? It's to, it's to actually understand that and I think I spoke about this even at the beginning in terms of how I foreground it, is that we have a responsibility, right? It's not an optional alliance. It's not an optional coalition that when it serves our needs that we can reach out um, to indigenous communities and indigenous movements. It's that we fundamentally have to orient our movements with, a, with an eye and a heart and a mind to being responsible to indigenous movements. Um, and that will, and then from that, that looks differently, right? Because of course, one of the greatest tropes of um, the ways in which we understand indigenous struggles is this kind of quote unquote pan-Indian notion, right? Of course it's gonna look different in the context and the lands in which we reside, um, the struggles that we're called on to support. Um, and I think that's another key piece, which is like actually being very specific in our lines of accountability, right? Being specific about who are we being accountable to. So, you know, just by one example, in the context of no one is illegal, um, there's multiple things that happen. Um, so one is, you know, of course, this like this committed principle that folks come to, like, and talk through, which is what does this look like? Um, the other piece is trying to be really clear about which communities we're organizing in solidarity with. So it's not just this general like I have a commitment to indigenous solidarity, which is, of course, necessary, but having clear lines of accountability is, I think, the primary or one of the, the one of the key ways in which any form of of allyship is built is being clear about who we are being accountable to. What is the specific community who are, you know, the elders or, you know, other community leaders within that community that hold us in check, right? We have to actually have concrete relationships with communities in order to be accountable. Um, and then in the context of um, you no know, one is legal, you know, this is by no means uh, a complete project, for, for example, but, um, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do at different times through No One Is Legal or the No One Is Legal Network is you know, do work within our different linguistic communities and cultural communities to do things like translate things that come out has been so key. So you know, right now, um, for me personally, it's, and it's going slowly because I have a, a newborn, but been working on translating a number of videos coming up from the Unistoten camp because they've requested those videos to be translated into other languages um, because some of the companies that they're fighting are operating in other parts of the world, like Chevron you know, is, is all over Northern Africa. Um, and so they've requested for those videos to be translated into different languages so that their struggles on the front lines and the blockade can reach out to different communities and can be screened in different migrant and you know, multilingual communities. Um, and you know, have, and we've done similar work like that um, around other struggles. And for me, that latter piece is a, is a really critical role um, that non-English speaking migrant communities can do and is a really concrete way to decolonize what's happening in our communities, right? Because people, one of the main ways in which our communities access information or knowledge about indigenous communities is through white supremacy and is through English language media. And for me, it is like, it is not a small thing to translate 
and put into our own media and our own community networks, you know, indigenous communiques or indigenous writings that are happening because then people hear not through like Sun Media or CBC about blockades or whatever is happening, people hear about it directly from those communities um, and in ways that they can understand because it's not in English. So um, for me, that has been immense. Like for me, you know, I am on South Asian radio stations quite constantly. Um, and South Asian radio is like, you know, not the same as English radios. It's not like you are this expert speaking on the radio, la la la. It's like literally people chatting all day long on the radio. Um, it's like old school talk shows, right? And so um, for, uh, for myself and a bunch of other folks in the Punjabi community, that's like one of the main ways in which, you know, we think that it's a really concrete specific tool to engage within the South Asian Punjabi community around indigenous struggles is to actually communicate to people in Punjabi about what's happening. Um, and you know, when the, when Sesnam was happening on Musqueam territory, which is the land reclamation that was happening when condos were going to be built um, on a sacred burial site, within a week of us doing that, and Cecilia Point, who was one of the spokespeople at Musqueam, one of the things that she said, because she was like, suddenly something's happening. She's like, at six in the morning, this massive delegation of South Asian truckers came by at six in the morning with a bunch of food and like brought us coffee and came down. She's like, she, she said, they kept hearing, they kept saying they heard something on the radio and I couldn't really understand what they'd heard on the radio. And then she was like, oh, is this the radio station that you're on? And we're like, yeah, that's the radio station that we're, we're talking about, right? So she's really, I'm trying to, I guess, visualize that there are lots of networks that we have access to that are, are resistant networks, that are cultural networks, that are linguistic networks, that operate beneath the kind of, you know, Eurocentric dominant idea of what media looks like. Um, and that are so critical to building resistance within our communities and are so critical to building alliance and, and responsible alliance with indigenous communities and that have played, you know, in very, you know, those are just some small examples, but have played a, a you know, small role um, in really bringing the reality of, of settler colonialism as understood by indigenous communities through a migrant, you know, not a migrant lens, but through our own ways of relating and understanding that isn't mediated by whiteness. Um, and really the English language. And I think those are, you know, it's just one concrete kind of tool. And I really encourage folks who, you know, have access to those networks to really um, take them seriously because they're a powerful tool in our communities. Hello, uh, my question's for Harsha. You mentioned temporary foreign workers as in indentured slaves. And I know from my family history, um, they were indentured slaves in Fiji. And there was, I've just recently started looking into my family history and there's a ridiculously high rate of suicide and depression. And I'm just wondering about um, if those are similar problems with temporary foreign workers and if the state is aware of what they've created. Um, I don't know, maybe other folks here know. I don't, um, I, I don't know generally in terms of, um, specifically in terms of rates of suicide, but there is like undoubtedly, if you look at the Living Caregiver Program, really high rates of intergenerational violence and trauma. Um, so with the Living Caregiver Program, which is a temporary foreign worker program that domestic workers come on, predominantly Filipina, um, you know, so the children of, um, of women who come under the LCP when they reunite with their mothers like 18, 20 years later in some cases, um, you know, there's a really clear connection between um, high school dropout rates, um, entry into so-called gang violence, uh, mental health issues in general, if not suicide. Um, I don't know about any specific links to suicide, but definitely mental health issues, um, you know, anger, like all of the kind of so-called youth at risk markers, which really is like youth at risk is just code for like your stuff, you know, you're forced to live under racism. Um, but there's, there's def you know, the, the Philippine Women's Center of BC has done extensive work to, to talk to youth, Filipino youth, who, um, whose parents have been exploited uh, under the LCP and looking at the intergenerational impacts of that, um, absolutely. And you know, there's, there's definitely not a lot of um, work that's been done to look at yeah, like what's happening to the, to the families of you know, some of the men who come from the Caribbean, for example, and spend like year after year for 30 years here in Canada, not only the impact on them, but yeah, what's the impact on their kids, right? And their families um, that they have this kind of in limbo relationship with. But the family separation is such a, is such a central part of that. Um, 
and I, I do know, like, you know, anecdotally, that definitely alcoholism is one of them, which is actually what, you know, so the employers who have this no drinking rule um, that I was mentioning, one of the things that they use is to say, like, well, these guys are all drunks, right? And it's like, well, without looking at this, what are the systemic conditions you've created that is forcing people to turn to, you know, drugs or alcohol or addictions in general. So, um, you know, there's definitely an, an undercurrent of, of all of that. Yeah. I think maybe that's enough for this evening. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you all.